Okay, and moving on to Rick Norwood. And boy, now we get into serious, serious comic art metaphysics. Um, because, okay, I've got, the, uh, I've got Rick Norwood's um, um, question, and I, I'm going to interrupt to, uh, at the beginning to, to front load this. Uh, Rick Norwood is publisher of uh, Comics Review, R-E-V-U-E, and uh, Rick, Rick Norwood uh, was the first person to break Dave Sims' con consecutive issue record, uh, according to Rick. It's, uh, you know, I, uh, Comics Review is going to get its issue 300 coming up. And <laughs> I didn't know what to say to Rick about that, just as I didn't know what to say to Todd about that, that you're going to break my record. I, I don't think you're doing the same thing that I'm doing, but... Um, I, you know, I do want to say, and I did, you know, I do very emphatically say to both Rick Norwood and Todd, uh, congratulations and well done. Uh, there's no, there's no easy way to do uh, 300 issues of anything, and uh, anybody doing 300 issues of something uh, deserves a, a nice round of applause from from Dave Sim. Uh, Rick Norwood is at. Uh, the latest issue of Comics Review I had come in was uh, he's got, he does double issues now, double issues now uh, to keep the price down was number 435, 436. And let me just say to Rick, uh, who I hope will be listening, uh, that I'm definitely looking forward to the October issue, uh, number 437, 438. Uh, particularly uh, the uh, continuation of Lee Falk and Phil Davis's Mandrake the Magician, the Museum Mystery from uh, 1940. Uh, definitely a peak form for both of those guys, Lee Falk uh, writing Mandrake the Magician and Phil Davis drawing Mandrake the Magician. Uh, Phil Davis, Alex Raymond clone. And uh, I got to say, looking at it going, sweating blood to at least match Raymond's Secret Agent X-9. And he's definitely very, very close. It, it, uh, all of these guys had the same exper experience with Raymond that I had lifelong experience with Neil Adams. Can I just match what he was doing 40 years ago? I don't even I don't even have to catch up to him now. Just forty years ago would make me hilariously happy, and you can see Phil Davis the same way. Um, you know, a good five years after uh, Alex Raymond left Secret Agent X Nine, going, why can't I do this? Why, I mean, it's uh, I see what he's doing, and I want to do it myself, and I'm sweating blood, and it's just not as good as he is. Well. This museum mystery from 1940 is uh, uh, is about about as close as you can get, and uh, it's it's a, you know the, these are these are continued stories, and it's a great thing when I do get hit, uh, hooked on one of these stories. There's uh, there's complete stories in uh, um, comics review, usually three of them per issue. And then the rest of them are continued. You get part two or you get part one or whatever. And if you get stuck on one, and I'm stuck on the museum mystery from 1940, as soon as it comes in, it's like, okay, I'm not going to read the whole thing because uh, comics review is like 120 pages per issue. Uh, so I, I got to pick my spots. But uh, I want to see Phil Davis sweating blood more and... Uh, how this museum mystery wraps up. Uh, a lot of fun. The, uh, the Phantom story was, uh, was complete uh, in this issue where the Phantom <laughs> becomes uh, the world, world champion uh, boxing, uh, boxing champion uh, as, as the masked, masked Marvel. 
and uh, really wildly, wildly implausible, but uh, really fun stories, and it's got a happy ending on it. It's, uh, they, they didn't believe in unhappy endings back then. Uh, no, it looks like you know, everything's going unhappily uh, uh, between him and, uh, and his girlfriend, but uh, they, they end up together in the, in the jungle at the end. So uh, if, 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 if you're tired of all of these morose <laughs> 21st century quote-unquote stories, unquote, uh, you, can't go, you can't go too far wrong with uh, uh, Rick Norwood's uh, comics review. So, moving on to uh, what Rick said, and uh, I am rereading Prince Valiant from the beginning to the present day. This is something all of you could do, and he's talking to all of you listeners, at least for the Hal Foster years. Although maybe not in the full page size, which I am privileged to have in my collection. Yes, we're all jealous as heck, Rick. Uh, They are so good. I can't resist sharing a few of the best. Uh, This post is political. Don't read the strip if your mind is closed on subjects political. Uh, Most people, uh, and then, okay, here here we're going to get to Rick Norwood's uh, political assertion. Most people who think seriously about politics agree that a benevolent dictatorship is the best form of government. Uh, Examples, Julius and Augustus Caesar, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, and Queen Elizabeth II. The trouble with benevolent dictatorship is that for every one benevolent dictator, there have been 99 malevolent or incompetent dictators. As Sir Winston Churchill pointed out, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Prince Valiant is so good, so far and away the best story strip ever, that I hope it survives. But then I think about politics because I hope the human race survives. And then added P.S. Hi, Dave Sim. Uh, your thoughts. Okay, let me so, stop you there real quick. So this was a post in the service Facebook group where it was the, the Prince Valiant image with what Rick said. And then he commented, P.S. Hi, Dave Sim. What do you think? And I'm like, well, since I'm doing the facts anyway, I'll put this in. There you go. Well, okay. So, uh, we, 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 it's a three-way courtship of, uh, of uh, comic art metaphysics because, um, where is his name here? Travis, Travis H., who is actually in Wisconsin, uh, Trego, Wisconsin, uh, September 24th, uh, he, uh, uh, mailed me a comic strip that has a please hold for Dave Sim question at the end of it. Obviously thinking if he mails it from Wisconsin, September 24th, it'll get there in time for uh, the first Thursday uh, in October, not knowing that uh, we were going to skip a week. And uh, Rolly picked up the mail today. So I open up this envelope from Travis and it's got a hand-drawn comic strip in it, which Roly has scanned and emailed to you to put on um, Please Hold for Dave Sim. And I'm looking at uh, what Rick Norwood had to say, and uh, uh, I'm thinking, okay, I got a rough idea of uh, uh, what I'm, what I'm going to say about this, um, but not specifically. Uh, let's Let's open up the other mail that we got here. So I opened up uh, Travis's package, and it was uh, a comic strip where I went, actually, that that says a lot of uh, what I would have to say to uh, uh, to Rick. Uh, uh, um, how about that? Uh, there's, there's a weird uh, comic art metaphysics thing. Um, now, I'm tra- I've got Travis's letter here somewhere. I hope I do. Uh, well, I can't. I can't find it. But anyway, he, he recreated uh, two panels um, from uh, uh, Detective Twenty Eight. 
27, Joe Schuster's spy and Jerry Siegel's spy story, first two panels, and uh, then he uh, he did a panel from uh, um, one of one of uh, Steve Ditko's uh, comics, and then he put the police hold question at the end, and the um, the uh, dialogue that he wrote in into these panels is from a book called uh, The Iron Heel by Jack London, 1908. And it's uh, the future. The people of that age were phrase slaves. The abjectness of their servitude was incomprehensible to us. There was a magic in words greater than the conjurer's art. So befuddled and chaotic were their minds that the utterance of a single word could negative the generalizations of a lifetime of serious research and thought. Such a word was the adjective utopian. The mere utterance of it could damn any scheme, no matter how sanely conceived. Vast populations grew frenzied over such phrases such as, quote, an honest dollar, unquote, and, quote, a full dinner paid, unquote. The coinage of such phrases were considered strokes of genius. And it's like, that's very well said. That's very well said. And then uh, uh, he's got a, a, a panel of, uh, from Steve Ditko's Miss Tree uh, now, and it's misogynist, Nazi, phobe, phobe, phobe. It's like, pick a noun, put bulb on the end of it, and it's exactly that thing. It's uh, a single word could negative the generalizations of a lifetime of serious research and thought. And we, we really, really need to knock it off, uh, I think. So that, uh, that having been said, then I can go on to, uh, okay, it's still... Uh, this is still way, way too too big a subject that uh, that Rick has presented me with here. So uh, as I always try to do, it's like okay, uh, type it out on the laptop so that you can you can keep it confined. Because if you just start talking, you're just going to you're just going to gibber at these poor people, and you've already been gibbering at them for for almost two hours. So what I had to, what I have to say, uh, Rick, is Julius and Augustus Caesar were no one's idea of benevolent. The dictator ultimately always has to kill his opponents, and the more opponents he kills, the more opponents he creates. Queen Elizabeth I and Queen Elizabeth II, and uh, on the latter, uh, may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest and God Save the King, were titular heads, the latter more than the former. Parliamentary democracy and English invention supersedes monarchical, monarchical dictatorship. As a monotheist, aligning with what I see as God's master clockwork mechanism, so long as the will of the people individually and collectively is expressed, Everything proceeds, however fitfully, to where we are going. More ladders than snakes. Anything that oppresses, suppresses, or invalidates the will of the people is doomed to failure because it keeps us from where we are going. Freedom of expression can only be slowed. It can't be stopped. The Shah is replaced by the Ayatollah because the Ayatollah is a more honest expression of the will of the people, the people in this case being Shiite Muslims in 1979. Forty-four years later, the will of the people reverts back in the direction of the Shah. Turkey has ping-ponged back and forth through most of the last century on this definition of true Islam. It becomes the iron fist, and then it relaxes, and it becomes the iron fist, and relaxes. Not relative to uh, to Western democ- 
bureaucracy, it never relaxes. It's always just the iron fist. But in their own context, uh, that's the situation. So applying this to Alita, queen of the Misty Isles, uh, quote, first she makes everyone happy except her treasurer by reducing taxes. The mounting prosperity of her kingdom will more than make up the loss, unquote. Well, this works up to a point, the point where you need to invent unimaginably large amounts of money to keep the game going. But we're long past that point, relative to the debts we, the people, owe. The taxes collected aren't a drop in a bucket. Something has to give, but we're not sure what. Quote, next, she banishes several overly ambitious citizens, unquote. Quote, overly ambitious, unquote, is a subjective viewpoint. King George III would have regarded George Washington as, quote, overly ambitious, unquote. Washington's personal ambition was beside the point. He and the Continental Congress's intellectual ambition was to work as quickly as possible towards a refinement of parliamentary democracy to limit the ability of government to interfere in the expression of God-given free will. The first of all moral and second of all material success of appropriate ambition attained, attain let me try that again, the first of all moral and second of all material success of appropriate ambition attained to speaks for itself. Quote, Queen Alita appoints a Congress of men from all walks of life, unquote. An appointed Congress can only be an arbitrary Congress, and God's will expressed through the trial and error of his creations, quote, men of well thinking, unquote, being the more literal translation of the more popular, quote, men of good will, unquote, is anything but arbitrary and can't be coerced. Getting back to the comic art metaphysics of this, uh, Travis was, uh, had just gotten a Windsor Newton Series 7 number two brush in the mail and had decided to start working on this comic strip that he was working on to uh, test out his, uh, his Windsor Newton Series 7 number two brush. And at the exact time that he was doing that, he was reading The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, and he got to the page with Raymond sharpening the brush and went, hey, thanks for the tip. I actually printed that page out when I was doing the Matisse cover of, okay, I know how to ink now, and it's like, yeah, I didn't buy a Windsor Newton Series 7 number two sable hairbrush. I bought the $4, hey, it's got a number two on the back of it someplace brush, and went, and it's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but at the same time, it's like, well, I can't screw it up because I'm, I'm pretty much doing this for myself, and if I don't like it, nobody sees it, and if I kind of like it, I'll show people, and if I really like it, I'll ask for money. Right. But yeah, that's, and, that, that is kind of a weird, whoop, you know, within two, three weeks of each other, all this stuff's happening. <laughs> yes, and then all um, swirled around uh, uh, today and all, all, all fell into place uh, exactly at the time that it needed to, which to me is that's when you know that you're on the right track of something because you're aligning yourself with God's clockwork mechanism. You're not freelancing, not going, let's see if I can get away with this. <laughs> it's, it's God. You can't get away with anything. How are you going to get away with something with someone who's omniscient? So uh, getting, getting to Travis's please hold for Dave Sim question, in the last panel he's got uh, Little Orphan Annie asking Dave Sim, Mr. Sim, why did you start using the Qbert font rather than having one created from your own lettering? Uh, because I, I like the Qbert font better than my own lettering. First of all, uh, it's technically better. 
I always wanted to be able to letter um, like a newspaper strip letterer in the classic days. Um, or, you know, the letterers that they had at Marvel. Uh, Tom Orzhikowski, when I first when I first knew of him, he was, uh, I saw his lettering in Media 5. I think I've told this story before. And I went, it looks like comic book lettering. My, mine looks nice, and I, it's very expressive, and it's got its, its own quality to it. But um, if I was to hand letter Rip Kirby, if I was to uh, hand letter um, an Al Williamson uh, Warren story, uh, I would just be dragging the whole thing down. It would be, uh, don't do that. Um, a, a, a good professional uh, lettering look is uh, uh, it is a, a rising tide uh, floats all boats. It's uh, you, you've already you've already made things easier on yourself just by going in that direction. Uh, speaking as a writer, uh, I can change stuff a, lo a lot more easily, and um, like that doesn't answer the why wouldn't I have it created from my own lettering. It's, uh, I, I'm doing The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, and I really want it to be in the same category as um, Heart of Julia Jones, um, Rip Kirby, um, Al Williamson's Secret Agent X-9. Uh, all, of, all of those strips uh, definitely had the, the classic lettering style to it. So uh, the automatic leg up for what it is that I'm doing visually that comes from uh, using the keyword font and the fact that uh, I'm able to write and letter simultaneously. When, I, when I'm mocking up the pages, uh, particularly the last week or so, I'm dealing with very, very intricate subjects where I'm going, okay, that, uh, I understand what I'm talking about, uh, but nobody else has a frame of reference for this. So how do I explain what I know in my head so that it all fits on this page? And then I sit down and, and type it out uh, in, as individual captions and then print it out on my printer and cut out the lettering and uh, glue it with, uh, with uh, um, masking tape, uh, just rolls of masking tape. I roll it up so that I can just stick it on the back and then stick it lightly to the page and then read it. Does this say what I want to say? Because it's uh, the first thing's been taken care of. Yes, it all fits on this page. That's my biggest concern. Um, where, what panels am I, am I going to excerpt from uh, from Rip Kirby and use them to illustrate what's in the captions? Okay, I have a pretty good idea what that is. Now, is there are there pieces missing from the concept that I'm trying to convey? And it's like usually, usually there is because um, that's not the uh, what specifically I'm trying to say isn't the problem that I'm solving at the time, uh, the problem that I'm solving is, does this all fit in one place? Once that's solved, then I get to, okay, uh, what, am I, uh, what am I actually saying here? And usually it's a situation where, okay, um, this has a nice word rhythm to it, but um, these two sentences that I have in one caption are going to be better if, uh, if they're um, two different captions, at which time I go, okay, does everything still fit on the page? Yes, it does, but I have to move it around a little bit so that I've got a room for uh, the two captions that used to be one caption. Um, a, lot of, a lot of time I start reading it and I go, oh, okay, um, I need to go across the panel uh, so I need to put this caption on this side of the panel that I photocopied out of the Rip Kirby book and 
then they have to read the Rip Kirby panel, and then I have to pick up on the internal logic of what's in the panel, or sometimes quote what's in the panel, because it's like, okay, um, you're just reading this as a panel from a comic strip, but there's a larger sense being conveyed here, so I'm going to have to quote it in a caption, so you have, here's the original uh, caption or word balloon, here's me quoting it, here's me explaining why this is more important than just, uh, this is Ward Green getting Alex Raymond from panel one to panel three, so he needs to say this in panel two. Uh, that's far easier to do when I'm looking at something that already looks like um, a classic newspaper strip. Um, Heart of Juliet Jones went back and forth. Uh, Stan Drake tried a number of different things and tried uh, machine lettering. And um, boy, you really no notice it. It's just a completely different voice when I was looking at his originals at uh, uh, Syracuse University. And uh, this, um, it, it was hand lettered before that, but he's going, no, it's slowing me down. I have to, I have to, you know, get one of the guys in Connecticut that does lettering to do my lettering. And that's taking up, you know, a day or two that if, uh, if I can just find a way to print out the lettering myself and stick it in, then that's an extra two days for the drawing. And it's like, boy, I can see the argument because looking at it, I'm going, yeah, uh, the, the extra day or the extra two days that he had for inking and penciling uh, are definitely on uh, uh, in the strip uh, exactly the way he intended it. But boy, does the, the, the lettering ever look lousy. And that's one of those, once you're doing it yourself, you go, okay, you don't, you don't want to trade this for that. Um, you're trading, trading too much for too little. Um, I, I appreciate the, the implied compliment when people say, you know, why didn't, why didn't you get just, uh, you know, your own, your own lettering, uh, uh, a font created that you could, you could do on, uh, on the laptop, it's, uh, no, I'd be, I'd be talking about Alex Raymond and Ward Green and Stan Drake and Al Williamson and Neil Adams and all of these guys in a very intense, very specific way and reading it in Cerebus's voice. And it's like, no, Cerebus is Cerebus. It's, uh, um, that, that's where it belongs. This belongs in, uh, um, strange death of Alex Raymond. I think, I think it was in Glamour Puss or around the time of Glamour Puss where you had said, somebody said, why aren't you hand lettering it? And you're like, because you wanted it to look like Ben Oda lettered it. And the closest you found was the Kubert font. Right. Right. And that, I mean. Yeah. And, it, it, and, and that's, uh, that's entirely true. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what it was about the Cubert font, but it was uh, no. That's that's the look that I want because I did see a uh, a Ben Oda font later on. I don't know if Comic Craft had done it, um, and I went. Uh, that's Ben Oda. That's the guy who had had the keys to. Uh, uh, pretty much every cartoonist house in, in Connecticut so he could let himself in and sit down and do the lettering while they were sleeping. And, uh, no, I, I, I like the Kubert font better, which uh, is surprising because I, I never really noticed, uh, noticed Joe's lettering on the stuff of himself uh, or the stuff that, uh, that he lettered himself. And I think that had to do with the fact that um, DC Comics had some of the best letterers at the time, Jasper Saladino and, and, and people like that. And those are the guys who lettered uh, all of Kubert's uh, Our Army at War and Sergeant Rock and stuff. So it's like I would look at, at 
at Joe's lettering on his own work, his independent work that he was doing outside of D.C. And it's like, oh, couldn't you have gotten Gosper Saladino to, to letter it? It would have looked so much better because uh, it, it just goes together like ham and eggs. And it's like, uh, I, not having seen the keyword font apart from, um, you know, Joe's lettering himself, it's like as soon as I saw it apart, it's like, wow, that's more Ben Oda than Ben Oda. Uh, maybe I need to look at a Gaspar Celadino um, font. I wonder, I wonder if there is one. I'm sure there is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there is. I mean, uh, I, I, I always think, well, okay, it doesn't, you know, things don't uh, move along quite that, that rapidly and thoroughly until, uh, you know, David Birdsong's faxing me uh, pages from uh, Art Barkey and Splendor, and it's like, well, son of a gun, uh, of course there's a Robert Crumb font. Uh, how, how many guys are doing um, indie comics and, and underground comics and they just ache to look like uh, like Robert Crumb? Well, okay, here's, here's your leg up. It's not, uh, it's not the best font in the world, but uh, it's very, very authentically Robert Crumb. The, I forget the name of the website. There was a site that was doing it where you could create your own font and it was free. But but once you created it, it got put into their database of fonts, and when they've reached a certain threshold, then they were going to start charging people. And I printed right. out the template, and I was like, I really sh you know should go through old service comics and work out a, a Dave font. And I and it was one of those. It's like, yeah, but at the same time, you know, is it worth it to do it? And then and then I'm pretty sure Sean ended up having to make an early service font for the remastering because there were, you know, the P's that looked like D's and, you know, f replacing some of them and, and fixing some of the errors that were in the first volume, I, you know, I believe he might have made one. And I've asked him, like, hey, did you make one? And he, he never really responds when I ask. <laughs> Which, you know, leads me to believe that the answer is yes, but you can't have it. <laughs> Which is um, short short sighted. I mean, that's that's up to whoever made the font. Uh, we we know it's going that way. I mean, uh, I don't think Grandpa is going to be in the ground too long before somebody goes, "He's dead, really?" Okay, I get to do my service stories now, and here's here's the Dave Sim font, and uh, you know. Uh, they're gonna talk themselves into the fact that, yeah, I'm I'm showing Dave Sim how it's done, just as I keep hoping that I can do that with uh, with Neil Adams. I will I will show I will show Neil Adams how Neil Adams is done properly. So, like the uh, go ahead. So that kind of segues into something that just happened to me this afternoon when I was getting out of work. I got an alert from Heritage that about a Dave Sim piece that was coming up for auction. And I went, looked at it and went, well, how much is it going for? And it was only at a dollar. So I'm like, all right, I'll throw some money at this. And it's an original undated piece by Wayne Robinson and Dave Sim. It's a... I'm trying to phrase this nicely in case you're the one that drew it, but I think Wayne might have been. It's a... Uh, a homage, if you will, to uh, the Batman on the cover of Detective 241, or Batman 241, I forget what the description was, and it's you know, it's very much a Neil Adams knockoff that very much looks like it's not Neil Adams, and it's colored, so I don't know if you drew it and he colored it, or if you colored it and he drew it, or if one of you inked it, one of you penciled it, or what, but right now, last I checked, I'm winning it 26 bucks. Close. I don't know, but I'm hoping if I tell everybody I'm bidding on this, you gotta let this one go. I mean, it's it it's not a great piece of art, but I think it's gonna have it's one of those where it's got that pedigree of this is early, you know, pre-service Dave Sim, and or this is Dave at a convention 
being real nice to the guy at the table next to him who's like, hey, could you color this? Oh, well, no, no, no. Uh, Wayne Robinson it was uh, a collector in town uh, when I was uh, um, still living at my parents' place, still, still in the basement, and, uh, uh, you know, do, doing comics, but mostly just being a uh, comic collector nerd in, uh, in my parents' basement. And uh, Wayne Robinson lived over in Forest Heights and was married and had, I think, two kids uh, at the time uh, and met him at, uh, at Now and Then Books because that's where I spent my life was, uh, you know, drinking, drinking Harry's tea in the kitchen for free at uh, Now and Then Books when it was at 103 Queen Street South. And uh, met Wayne Robinson, and he was one of the few guys that uh, knew all of the same stuff that I did about uh, um, Golden Age uh, DC Comics, and was a collector of Golden Age DC Comics. So it's like, wow, here's a guy that that I can uh, show off to. You know, uh, look at my uh, uh, Superman number ten my uh, Superman number 22 and uh, my, uh, my world's finest number seven and uh, invited him over to my parents' place. And that was, that was weird having somebody visiting me who is, was probably closer to my dad's age um, than, than, than my age at the time. But uh, the, uh, Shared comics interests uh, at the time when uh, it was very clandestine and illicit was uh, was baked in uh, on that. So I think the, the situation was that uh, either he copied the figure and I inked and colored it, or I copied the figure and he inked and colored it. Um, I, I'd be willing to bet he doesn't know either. I, I saw him at uh, um, uh, the local, local comic shop. Uh, uh, how long ago would that be? Six years ago? Five years ago? And he goes, uh, I bet you don't remember the name Wayne Robinson. <laughs> and I went, are you kidding? You were the you were the major DC fan. You were the you were the guy that I could talk to about uh, World's Finest Number Seven having uh, the first appearance of uh, of, of, uh, of Batman with his with his white snow costume and uh, an appearance by the Golden Age Sandman in the back. And this is Superman Seventeen with the first appearance of the Fortress of Solitude. And you could nod and go. And what about uh, the first person, uh, appearance of Mr. Mixian's pet lick in uh, service number 30? Yeah, yeah, that wasn't actually on the cover, but, uh, and it was spelled differently in the first appearance. The second appearance, uh, for some reason, Jerry Siegel changed the, uh, and we could just talk for hours like that because it's like, wow, this is exactly like talking to somebody in my head. <laughs> Well, the, the piece is signed by both of you, so if I win, I'll let you know. I mean, I'll, I'll, okay. probably, I'll probably grab the uh, image off of Heritage and send it to Raleigh to, you know, print out and color and show you. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I never wanted to see that Batman again. <laughs> well, I, I'd be interested to see it just from the standpoint of I, I don't remember this. And, uh, well, I... How about that? Because uh, obviously, obviously, I did it. Where, where would, where would somebody counterfeiting a Dave Sim come up with the name Wayne Robinson? Well, it's from the Darren Shan collection, so you know, I'm sure that Darren didn't just buy it because somebody had scribbled your name on it. Right, right. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Matt, let's see if I'm, I'm missing anything here. I think. No, we got all the way to the end. So, and uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I gave away all my October surprises during this, so I have nothing else at the end. 
Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. I do. I forgot. I even wrote a note to ask. So, the Flash Gordon volumes you have, those are the kitchen sink press ones? Uh, no, they're the IDW. Oh, okay. See, I have the inferior old kitchen sink press thinner volumes. Yeah, we we don't even walk across the street and throw rocks at them. <laughs> it, I don't know if I ever told you this. So, uh, years ago, I was doing something and I had a kitchen sink book and I met and then I, and I mentioned the name Dennis Kitchen to my mom and my mom went oh I went to college with him and I'm like what oh yeah and and she you know telling me oh yeah oh I had, my god Wisconsin right 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 and I'm like I'm like what oh yeah he we had a creative writing class together and he he was one of the guys in the class I'm like well, okay what what do you know about this I mean I'm like major figure in comics in Matt's mind, some guy she kind of knew in college, in my mom's mind, I'm like, well, you know, you got to have some stories, mom. Like, uh, he gave great notes in our creative writing class, but and he was kind of a weirdo, but other than that, no, I don't really remember him. And I thought at one point she said that you know, he had asked her out on a date and she had turned him down. And and it's one of those, every time Dennis Kitchen's name comes up, I'm like, oh yeah, my mom went to college with him. People are like, really? And I'm like, you know, if they're in the comics, they're like, yeah. What was he like? She really doesn't have any stories. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Yeah, we, we always you always think that famous comic book people just sort of appear in thin air at some point. It's like, no, we, we got backstories of, uh, uh, of people who, uh, who famous, famously ignored us. <laughs> uh, quick, quick story, I gotta go because the last prayer time's coming up at... Uh, Two minutes to eight. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, the plumber that I had in, I, I don't know if I got really to send you the picture of uh, uh, the plumber came in to uh, uh, do some plumbing stuff that I've been putting off. And he walks in and he's got a uh, Superman crest tattoo on the inside of his forearm. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, well, you just came in through the Superman entrance. Let me show you my... Uh, my Joe Sh- my letter from um, Joe Schuster's sister uh, 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 to Dave Sim on the one side, and the picture that I drew of Joe Schuster for the Schuster Award, and uh, here's uh, my two-page letter from Jerry Siegel when we worked on Ricky Robot on the other side, and he's just going like, "Wow, wow, wow!" And I said, "Now don't you charge me for this time." Because I'm going to let you read the letters, uh, and it's like, no, 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 wow, wow. So we, we, we took a picture. But even before that, when I was phoning uh, the plumber to say, uh, this, this is what I, what I want to have done, and uh, missed the person that I was supposed to talk to, the person who sets it all up. Name's Holly. Okay, talk to Holly. And uh, it's... Uh, Hi, Holly. Uh, I, I'd like to get some uh, some plumbing done, and this is the thing I want done. This is the thing I want done. She went, uh, okay, that's uh, that, uh, that sounds like pretty basic stuff. Do you want this thing? Do you want that thing? Go through all of that. And she goes, uh, have you ever uh, used uh, our plumbing service before? And I said, yes, I have. I said, okay, I'll, I'll check for your information on our database. Uh, what's your name? And I went, uh, Dave Sim. S I M, and she goes, "Oh my God, Evad! It's Evad!" I'm going, "Evad? There's not a lot of places that I was Evad the anti Dave. The only one that I can think of is Peter's place." And she goes, "It's Holly Hollywood. Her her name is literally Holly Wood." And I'm going. She was, she was part of the crowd at Peter's place. Uh, she hung around with uh, um, Val, who is in France now, has been in France for a while, and uh, Helen, who married Dino. You know Dino from, uh, from Melvin. And uh, they, were, they were, for me, Helen and Holly and Val. Oh, my. <laughs> Helen and Holly and Val. Oh my! So uh, 
<laughs> autographed uh, uh, three copies of uh, uh, Flailing at Love and, and indicated, I, I didn't write this one, David Bursaw wrote this one, I, I just tweaked it, and I personalized it on the front, each one of them, to Helen and Holly and Val. Oh my, <laughs> Helen and Holly and Val. Oh my, and made the lettering bigger on each one. I said, you decide who gets which one. So that was one of those, okay, just just going, that that was weird enough. And in walks the guy with the, with the Superman tattoo. And uh, he, he, he was just absolutely bubbling, didn't have the, uh, the connection for the shower head that he needed. So went over to a local supply place to, uh, to pick one of those up. And he just had, had to babble at the guy behind the counter, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's this cartoonist and, and his name's Dave Sim. And he goes, Dave Sim, you went to the off White House? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, I'm completely unknown in Kitchener. Let's, can we get back to completely unknown in Kitchener? Anyway, on that note, we will, we will leave off because I'm, I'm almost late for my prayer time. Okay. Have a good night. Have a good night, Matt. You too, Dave. We'll do this again next month. I hope so. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.